Hey, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for joining Lighter Capital for our very first webinar, Which Funding Option is Right for Your Business? My name is Ann Barker. I'm an associate here at Lighter Capital, and I will be facilitating our discussion today. And Rob Belcher will be leading our discussion. He is a VP here at Lighter Capital, and he has helped hundreds of business owners navigate the funding process through his role here at Lighter and previously at Voyager Capital, a West Coast venture capital firm. So for a couple of reasons that we'll get into in a minute, financing discussions for early stage technology businesses typically focus on the sexiest and most elusive source of funding, venture capital. In reality, however, there are numerous financing options available throughout the business life cycle, and it is the goal of this webinar to explore some of them, including VC. At the end of this discussion, we hope to have shared a high-level overview of different options that are and are not the most appropriate at different business stages and the pros and cons of each so that you can plan your financing roadmap and get financing that is the best fit for you. So in short, we are going to walk through the four stages of the business life cycle and funding options available at each, followed by a Q&A. And if there's enough interest, we will host future webinars that will dive deeper into some of these questions. And since this is our very first webinar, we certainly welcome your comments, feedback, and questions. There will be a two-minute survey at the end of the webinar, and if you can't stick around to the end, we will follow up with a survey via email. In addition, we will post this content on the Lighter Capital blog so that it's available anytime. And some nuts and bolts, throughout this webinar, I will be on hand via chat on the Citrix GoToWebinar dashboard to answer any quick software or more quick, simple, content-related questions, such as de definitions of terms, as they come out up throughout the webinar. And then I will save your more in-depth questions for Rob to discuss during our Q&A. If we can't get to all of your content-related questions during this webinar, we will follow up via email. And with that, I'm going to let Rob take it from here. Thanks, Anne. You're welcome. <laughs> no, first, oh, there we go. OK, so a little bit about lighter capital. First off, just to get started. So Lighter Capital is three things. We're an investor in early stage technology and software companies. We invest 50K to a million dollars in growing companies. We invest using a specialty debt product that is an entrepreneur friendly structure called a revenue loan, which is a revenue based finance where the investment is paid back uh, with a small monthly revenue share instead of equity. And lastly, we use technology to make the diligence, underwriting, and servicing processes very fast and efficient. Uh, so you can get off the fundraising road and uh, back to building your business. We call this capital as a service and more about revenue-based finance shortly. So first, a couple announcements. Uh, first, this webinar, all things considered, is relatively high level and is certainly not exhaustive of all the funding sources out there. Also, every specific provider of capital is going to have their own terms and criteria. And so here I've just tried to present the general terms and criteria for any given uh, capital source. Your experience may certainly vary. Um, also, to keep the scope of this conversation within reason, this webinar is focused only on the financing options for software and technology businesses. We won't cover anything like inventory financing, uh, purchase order financing, or asset-backed lending. Also, since this is a high-level introduction, it should be pretty accessible to most attendees, but it does use some common financial abbreviations, terms, and industry jargon. Uh, so, as Ann mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them via chat to the organizer in the webinar control panel. And if you find any portion of the conversation particularly interesting today, uh, we'd love to dive into for uh, deeper info. Uh, if you'd like to dive in for deeper info, please send us a chat or a follow-up email. And we can either do a follow-up webinar on a specific topic or certainly just talk offline. Uh, and, and then lastly, provide any you know, uh, resources or, or connections to other people that are experts in a given field or something uh, if, if you have uh, follow-up questions. Um, and then down here at the bottom is a little proverb or a saying that I, I heard once that's very fitting for today's conversation. Okay, so the B-School four stages of the business life cycle are startup, growth, maturity, and decline. And decline is also called the harvest or exit stage. And this is the B-School uh, definition, like I said, which is, you know, the curriculum is 20, 30 years behind the times and is, is more fitting for uh, building built businesses like the next Caterpillar, GE, or Coca-Cola. So I think there's an important, um, if not one or maybe several, sub-stages or pre-stages to the startup stage for the 
uh, startup and technology industry specifically, the software and technology industry specifically, um, and then even uh, drilling down further into the subscription economy or the, the SaaS model, that kind of thing, uh, there's the incubation or the aspirational stage. Uh, so this is, these are the four stages we'll talk about today, which is stage zero, if you will, through to maturity. Um, I've also included here some annual revenue figures. Like Ann said, we've talked to literally hundreds of companies, and so these are the stages we've really found with breakpoints, um, anecdotally talking to all these companies. So I thought it would be good to provide some context for our conversation. Uh, again, the, no hard and fast rules here. This is just our experience, which hopefully is helpful for you to, to get a sense for what we're talking about and what we see. Um, you know, other, other capital sources, other, um, uh, you know, certainly business school professors might disagree with these stages, but this is what we're talking about today and will be the, the context for what uh, we, we talk about here in a minute. Um, also, the very last stage, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that, the decline, exit, and harvest stage. Uh, this is the land of IPOs, M&A, or cash flowing your business while you're on the beach, and it's out of scope of this webinar, which focuses much more on how to get to that stage. But as you'll see here in a second, that stage is really critical as it, it defines your long-term goal and guides how your business is built from the get-go. Uh, so while we won't spend much time on it, on the mechanics of that stage, we're going to actually start there. Uh, and then certainly if there's interest in talking more about how to register for uh, a public offering, um, you know, reverse triangle mergers and leverage recapitalizations and all kinds of other um, uh, transaction-oriented topics, we'd, we'd love to address those offline or in future web webinars. So uh, as I said, the, the end game and, and what, what different companies are when they've grown up is uh, very important for how you finance the company from the get-go and how you get to that stage. So while you can never predict how things will go, it's critical to make and update a business plan, a budget, or a roadmap. And I won't specifically cover the mechanics of the end game. Like I said, uh, it's very instructive to start here. So quite simply, what kind of business are you building? And um, how and when does, you know, these are some of the questions that are, are important for you to keep in mind as you build your business because it will um, weed out or uh, elucidate some of the financing options that uh, are best for your business. So some questions, you know, what is the business model of the B2B, B2C, B2G? Do you have a revenue model? You know, obviously Facebook just recently discovered one, but that doesn't mean they hadn't been building value in some other way all along. Uh, what's your goal for the business? Uh, how will you recognize success when you see it? Is it a million users? Is it a million dollars in revenue? Is it reaching profitability? Is it a, a $10 million acquisition price, a $100 million acquisition price? Um, and then, you know, how big is the market for the product? And, uh, you know, are you, are you looking to acquire 50% of that market, just 1%, those kind of questions? Are there any strategic alliances in your industry? Uh, so these are, these are some important things to keep in mind. And I think, uh, I think some case studies here will really help define more about what I'm talking about. So here's two case studies. This is the Swing for the Fence case study. Two co-founders started this company in 2009. In its first 18 months, they built all the software, they did all their beta tests, they, they got some real customers, and they, they raised some money from uh, friends and family and angels. They got a great big uh, BD deal in 2010 and started their exponential growth. They raised three rounds of VC for a total of $55 million with the last valuation of $150 million. Uh, so today they're growing at over 200% a year. They've got $15 million in revenue, but they're still losing quite a bit of money. So this is what we call the steep J curve. Right, they've, they've spent deeply, they've deficit spent uh, very deeply to grow, come out the other side at a very steep growth rate. Um, so the founders now own 20% and VCs own uh, 65% of the company. Now another case study of a different uh, financing path and a different growth path is a company that has two founders that started the company in 2008. Uh, the CEO basically self-financed the company. They started with professional services and consulting to just get some money in the door while at the same time they were developing their enterprise app, and now their licensing revenue is, is steadily increasing. And they're tailing back their consulting and spending more time on their, their app. Uh, they've taken financing uh, for 500K in a revenue-based loan, and they've got bank financing for 100K. Today they're 25 employees. They're still growing quite fast, but obviously not as fast as the VC-backed company. They have $3 billion in revenue, and they're profitable, and the founders own 98% of the company. They've actually been turning down offers to buy the company, and they, they want at least $10 million valuation before they sell. Um, 
ultimately uh, acquisition is in mind, but they're in no rush to sell. They're, they're busy building themselves, building value. And the, the company pays dividends to the CEO and to staff out of the profits, and they'll sell when the time is right. So this is a lifestyle tech business. You see the top uh, lifestyle in, in quotes. Um, and it's kind of become a bad word in the VC, in the, the startup, in the tech space, mostly because VCs have been the ones to define a company as either VC backable or lifestyle. And for some reason, uh, that's lost to me, entrepreneurs have decided that success is defined as being VC backable. So uh, ergo, being a lifestyle business is to fail or just be mediocre. So I hope, I really hope that these case studies show that this is not the, not the case and that um, all of those answers to the questions we covered on that first slide are, there's, there's no judgment on what those answers are. You know, all businesses have value and it, it's, it's certainly not that there's one way that is better um, despite um, you know, being VC backable and being on the rocket ships seems to in the industry uh, have the most uh, uh, panache or, or you know, interest of, of entrepreneurs. So that's some context going forward um, and uh, I want to now jump into the stages. Um, I just want to interrupt with a question from the audience. Um, I have someone who wants to know what does the J and the J curve stand for? Yeah, the J curve, that's a good question. The, the J and the J curve is actually the shape of the curve. So it's shaped like a J. And I can, I'll post something, it, it, or you can, you know, there's a Wikipedia article on J curve, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it, it's, it's the shape of your revenue growth or your profitability, basically. So it's a deficit early on where you go down the J, and then you come out the other side uh, coming up the J. And the, the, um, the point there is that with the VC-backed company, the J curve is much steeper, steeper uh, deficit spend and steeper growth coming out the other side. Whereas a company that's profitable from day one won't have a J. It'll actually just be a line, right? Uh, but if your deficit's spending a little bit, you know, it's a flatter J. Thanks, Anne. Um, okay, so stage one is the ideation and incubation stage. This is uh, the, the two guys in a garage stage. This is you have your idea and you're, you're kind of building it in your spare time. And that's, that's the best way to get started with financing this stage is keeping your day job. Also, uh, these other personal financing sources, credit cards, maybe your, uh, your 401k savings or a HELOC or uh, your personal savings. The advantages here are low cost of capital, sort of. Um, you know, there's, there's some trade-offs there, obviously, uh, with the last negative down there being the other one is that uh, while this is a low cost of capital, you, you've got um, some significant personal financial concentration going on, and it's just up to you what your appetite for risk is there. Um, there, it's obviously there's no legal fees and there's there's very little hassle to get started and you just just kind of come up with an idea and start working on it. Um, and then depending on who you are and how wealthy you are and how much spare cash you have, it's typically a limited dollar amount to get you started. Uh, I did hear another there's another proverb that I'll share with you about um, concentration versus diversification. Is that uh, I've heard that diversification is the way to conserve capital while concentration is the way to grow it. So something to keep in mind, well, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket necessarily. That's certainly the way to uh, grow that basket the most or the fastest. Um, another source, friends and family. This can take uh, all kinds of uh, structures. It can be quite formal, a uh, formal legally documented loan, or it can be just sort of a napkin or you know, a napkin loan or a gift um, from friends and family and can take all kinds of structures. So again, low cost of capital, very little legal fees, if any very low hassle and fast. The, the biggest downside here is it's not your personal financial concentration this time, it's Uncle Bob's. And so just making sure you manage Uncle Bob's personal uh, concentration into your, your business and making sure he's not uh, overly concentrated with what you're working on because uh, it can certainly uh, strain personal relationships if things don't go well. Now moving into a little bit more formal sources of capital, angel investors, uh, they typically invest using convertible debt or straight equity. One of the advantages here is these guys are usually, and girls, are usually very experienced either entrepreneurs or industry uh, executives, and so they have a ton of experience to share with you and uh, plenty of connections also to introduce you to all kinds of people from customers to potential acquirers to board advisors uh, to potential hires. Uh, angel investors are pretty, you know, there's not very many of them. The dollars are competitive, and it's also very, very slow to close. It's very notorious uh, that angel, angel groups are like herding cats. You know, um, the, the priority is to get together once a month and have lunch and socialize, and the second priority is to invest in companies. 
Um, so grants and fellowships, this is an interesting one, depending on what industry you're in. There's some really interesting things, especially in high capital intensive indus research industries like uh, energy and uh, life sciences and uh, health, health services. So definitely do some research on these. They can be um, really interesting, again, depending on what you're doing, what you're working on, what you're researching. Um, they can be highly competitive, and it can certainly take a lot of time uh, to fill out all the applications and then the processes and things. But generally, um, if you can find a grant or something, it's, it's great. So check that out. Lastly, business incubators. Most of you have probably heard of Techstars, Y Combinator, et cetera. Um, these are pretty interesting things. There's been a little bit of fatigue in the space for incubators, but generally um, I think they're, they're pretty good depending on what you're working on and what stage you're at. They have an advantage of, of being in the co-working space, so getting you out of the garage if you've gotten serious enough that you're um, spending some significant time during the day on this project. You can meet all kinds of people in these spaces, kind of like the angel investor um, uh, positive that I talked about earlier. Um, you can meet potential customers, uh, beta testers, maybe hires, even uh, potential acquirers. And then certainly these things come with um, money, uh, mentors, some brand names, depending on which group you're in. Um, they're also very competitive. Some of them are in classes. You know, you'll do a three-month intensive, and then you, you get booted out of the nest, and away you go. And then um, most of them don't actually offer you that much cash, uh, kind of 20K, and then they'll take a little bit of dilution. So something to think about there. Okay, what's not available at this stage? Pretty much any professional corporate financing. That includes venture capital, banks, and specialty finance companies. Um, I think it's a little bit of a misconception that VCs invest in these, these type of companies right out of the garage ideas, if you will, um, and that, that all tech companies are backed by VCs or should be. I think this is a, a, because of a couple factors. Historically, if you had a great idea for, say, uh, an engine or an algorithm that searched content on the World Wide Web, you had to physically go buy and manage expensive servers. But up until somewhat recently, it was actually very expensive to start a tech company, and, and so you had to raise a whole bunch of cash to do so, and you'd go get that from venture capitalists. Also, selection bias. So newsmakers like Google, Yahoo, Tumblr, Instagram all raised venture, and look how successful they are, right? Um, but there are thousands and thousands of failures that also raised venture, but there's also millions of very successful companies that never did. Um, so something to think about there. And then lastly, the media. Um, I actually get a little bit annoyed at the media because I think um, this is a little bit of a rant, but I think the media is, is really responsible for the VC fanboyism that exists in the technology startup world. This is particularly true for first-time or younger entrepreneurs whose only experience and in indus uh, in industry connections are virtual and through the tech blogs. And the big tech blogs keep their readership up by obviously reporting on the next crazy new $25 million financing of a stealth mode company started by a couple uh, um, uh, dropouts out of school, right? Um, and the company and the VCs that did the deal, they love the PR, so it's a continuous cycle. So based on reading all the tech, the tech blogs, you'd think that all businesses should and want to get uh, VC funding. But here's the, the, the true numbers on it. There are 75,000 small, meaning anywhere from 100,000 to a million dollars in revenue, inf information businesses, IT businesses in the U.S. And there were only 1,700 Series A deals closed in 2012. So that's uh, about 2.3% of all IT companies in the U.S. actually got venture funding last year. Very, very, very small number. So that's why we're here talking today about other options. Okay. Stage two. Now, this is a really interesting stage. And from our experience working with um, early stage technology companies, this is uh, one of the most interesting, exciting, and complex stages. There's a whole lot going on at this point, and that's why um, I've included, actually, you can see $0 as the revenue amount, because um, you, can, you can actually have a company uh, basically graduate from the aspirational incubation stage to the, this launch stage and still have zero revenue because of other things, namely growth rate. So uh, this stage encompasses all kinds of things, from a company that's doing $600,000 a year and has basically maybe grown 10% a year or so over the last couple of years, but relatively flat, all the way down to a company doing 16000 a month, but it's been doubling every month for the last six months, right? So the, the, the financing options for those two companies, even though they're in the same stage, so to speak, are very, very different. Uh, so it's, it's a really interesting stage. So this, we're actually going to spend a fair amount of time on this. Okay, so at this point, all the stage one options are still available and used quite frequently. 
more personal financing, angel investors are, get more excited, obviously, if you have revenue and customers. Um, but now you're actually up and operating, and you're a real company, so you have some operating financial uh, opportunities here. So, um, you know, one is, is customer prepays. Kickstarter, crowdfunding, that kind of thing, especially if you've got a, a consumer product, has become pretty popular these days to get you some capital in the door, some very low cost of capital capital. And then uh, strategic terms from your vendors, if you have any, and again, customer prepays uh, on, on that side. And then you can certainly finance, uh, you can save, this is actually, you're kind of uh, providing financing, you're not actually getting in capital, but you're saving capital by offering equity in lieu of salaries to new hires. So generally all of these things are relatively low cost of capital. Um, there, there's, some, there's some caveat there that there's actually an opportunity cost here of, of you know, if you're going to use this type of capital, are you losing out by not taking more expensive but still NPV positive outside capital? But generally, uh, your, your incentives are aligned with all your customers, your vendors, and your new hires, and uh, certainly you're building your business and your credibility uh, by having terms with vendors. And then, like I said, the, the opportunity cost of not actually taking on capital growing faster, and then whatever founder dilution by offering equity to new hires. Okay, it's in this stage that VCs really become interested. And it's probably where most uh, speed and, and, and Series A deals get done. Most people are pretty familiar with venture capital, but I'll go through it. Uh, regardless, pretty quickly here, venture capitalists offer large uh, capital investments relative to the size of the company, which is one of its biggest benefits. Uh, obviously, they take equity in exchange for their investment. You are, similar to the angels, you get access to human capital, networking, uh, and all kinds of mentorship and experience training. The big downside, the biggest downside is probably the dilution and also loss of board control. The under or the uh, the investment and diligence process is very lengthy and involved and can take months. And as I discussed, it's very, very competitive and there's a limited number of investments every year. Also, taking venture is definitely a rocket ship. You saw from my case study early on. Uh, there are there are generally two options when you take VC, and that's to get to the moon or I guess nowadays get to Mars. Uh, or explode on the way. Uh, they, they don't want you necessarily to just turn into a company, right? That's not what they're looking for. They're looking for big, big, big explosive growth. There is this sort of unsavory third option of drifting through space and time with no food, water, or fuel um, that, that can happen every once in a while. Uh, so these are that's a, certainly something to think about, that if you're taking venture, you are signing up for something, and, and just closing the round is not success in itself. I think that's also a common entrepreneur misconception that just closing the round and getting VC is making it, right? Pop the champagne, we just raised a round. Uh, hold on, you know, you've got, you've got a long way ahead of you. And at this stage, revenue-based financing is an option. It's an alternative, it's entrepreneur-friendly, it's a hybrid structure, and as I discussed with our structure, it's an upfront investment in exchange for a monthly revenue share that goes towards repaying the principal amount plus interest. Uh, it, there are different providers of RBF and, and they have different structures. We, we offer a debt product, it's, it's a loan with little to no dilution. It's cheaper than equity. We don't take a personal guarantee, nor do we take a board seat or have strict financial covenants or ratios like a bank might. Our process is very fast. We close in about two weeks, and the payments are flexible. As your revenues dip, so do your payments. As you grow, your, your payments uh, also speed up a little bit, and you pay it back a little faster. Certainly, the downside is it's a little more expensive than bank financing, but at this stage, bank financing really isn't an option, or it, it is if you'd like to uh, include a personal guarantee. Uh, and then the, the dollar amount of investment is limited uh, by the revenue run rate of the company because we're, you're paying it back out of the revenue of the company. You can imagine a company doing a million dollars a year in sales. If we were to do an investment of a million dollars and wanted to get paid back just the principal amount, not even considering uh, interest, but just the principal amount in two years, we'd have to take 50% of every dollar that came into the business just to get paid back in two years. If we want to get paid back the principal amount in one year, we have to take 100%, right? So it just doesn't make sense. It's, it's, not, um, it's not beneficial for everyone. So the, the dollar amount is usually limited. We, we invest about a third of a company's run rate. We do take consideration growth rate and that kind of thing. But so in the case of that million dollar company, we can usually invest about 300K, two to 400 usually. Okay, what's not available at stage two here? Um, strategic investors are a maybe. Uh, they're kind of, they're really interesting, and um, 
the you know these are these are investments and partnerships with industry participants, and it depends on the industry. It totally depends on uh, internal factors with the strategic uh, competition with yourself and competition with the, the strategic, your own traction, your own growth rate, uh, and like I said, internal politics and things. Um, whether they would like to get involved with you at this early stage or or not. Um, some great benefits here. It's a obviously you're set up for a, a future acquisition with that strategic. Uh, it's great for credibility, great for PR, um, obviously, you know, tremendous resources and connections. And usually you get pretty good terms with a strategic investment. You know, they're, they're, they're looking to have a partnership and they want it to be a win-win. Downsides are it's inflexible. You're usually tied to that one partner. If you end up getting a deal with your two, tier two or tier three partner target, uh, you're pretty locked in. Uh, certainly you can, you can maybe make changes down the road. You know, you can always make changes, but it's going to be tough. Uh, if down the road you grow and, and your tier one approaches you. Also, a lot of bureaucracy in a lot of these big companies, the bigger they are, usually more bureaucracy. Um, and even if they're fast growing, but um, you know that could even be a, a hindrance too, even if they're not that bureaucratic. Um, and the final deal that you end up with may not be what you originally signed up for and you've been making plans all along. Uh, we've seen that a lot with a company that is, is on track to get a certain BD deal or a certain partnership deal, and then in the end, the, the final deal is actually quite a bit different than the original, and they've been planning all along for X, Y, Z and have to make changes at the end. And tr certainly traditional bank financing is pretty much not available to a company of this stage, specifically a software technology company that has limited assets. Like I said, maybe if you're willing to sign a uh, personal guarantee, maybe that would become uh, a possibility. But at this point, there's really no uh, no bank would be that interested. Banks tend to look for uh, at least two to three years of profitability, stability, and uh, a solid track record of financial reporting. And companies at this stage, again, depends on who you are and what your growth rate is. But they're just growing too fast. They're they're dipping, you know, month to month into uh, deficit. And that kind of thing. So a, a bank really is, is not geared for that kind of risk. So that leads us to stage three, which is really the million dollar to five million dollar range from what we've seen. And that's really when banks get uh, involved. So at this stage, all the stage two options are available, including strategics. Uh, strategic investors are, are certainly interested at this point. You've got a proven track record, that kind of thing. Um, and then, like I said, banks become involved. So different products available that we've seen are term loans, uh, accounts receivable, lines of credit, and factoring of receivables. Uh, the advantages here are low cost of capital. It's by far the lowest cost and um, the largest number of financing options at this point. Certainly difficult for tech companies to secure uh, term loans and factoring. It takes many months. They're very slow to close. Uh, a lot of diligence, a lot of diving into tax records and financials and things. Uh, and they want to see that you have a lot of controls in place. Um, and it, it kind of depends on what your AR is, but if you've just got an AR line, which is one of the easiest to procure, it actually might not necessarily be that much cash for you to, to invest. Okay, and as we discussed, we're not going to talk too much about financing options at this last stage. However, um, you know, things to, to think about are, uh, what, what you're, you know, kind of, this is a little bit self-deterministic at this point. You, you know, you're on, you're on the road that you, you've taken, although as Led Zeppelin says, there's always time to change the road you're on. Um, you, but you, you've certainly made a lot of decisions at this point, and you are who you are. Um, and uh, this stage is all about aligning uh, financing with the, the, your business needs and your timing and, and planning for, for the future. And so at this stage, actually, you've got a whole bunch of different questions and different decisions to answer that are totally outside the scope of this webinar, but still very interesting. Because you're probably doing maybe some international expansion. Now you've got currency issues, transfer pricing, you're setting up joint ventures, offshore subsidiaries, um, you know, just tax issues, insurance things, a whole lot of more questions if now you become a very real business and need to have a lot of financial controls in place and things like that. Um, so it's, it's, it's very, you know, there's, like I said, a whole lot of different uh, questions to answer at this stage, um, and then, you know, as you're as you're you're thinking about the next stage, you can certainly look to RBF, revenue-based finance, for a quick growth spurt, uh, or to do an acquisition yourself to to make a quick acquisition before an IPO, or if you are the sustainable, um, you know, growing fast, 75% lifestyle business at this point, you can cash flow the business, pay yourself dividends, 
and align your financing to to grow as you need as you see fit and and take on financing like a RBF for instance uh, to finance new projects or acquisitions as they come up okay to summarize a little bit about what we talked about today I've got a couple of interesting graphs here to share with you on risk reward of these different capital sources from the investor perspective and the entrepreneur perspective um, the investor perspective is pretty straightforward. Uh, equity investors take the biggest risk, and they stand to lose it all or, or do quite well, right? That's, that's very common, and everyone knows that the investor, the equity investor profile is looking for a 10x or, or, or not, right? Revenue-based finance is somewhere in between equity and bank loans. Bank loans take very little risk. They require personal guarantees. Um, they, you know, they've usually got assets behind the business, whether it be receivables or hard assets. And they, they definitely wait until the company is pretty stable and they've got really good visibility into the, the history and the, the forecast. And so they, they stand, they offer, but in exchange for that, they can offer the lowest cost of capital. So from their standpoint, they, they make the least amount of money but take the least amount of risk. Revenue-based finance is somewhere in between. We don't take personal guarantees. We're more like equity on the downside. Uh, if the company goes south, we are debt. You know, we're first in line. It's a secured position. We try to get paid back but um, we certainly stand to lose a fair amount if, if things don't go well. And on the upside, uh, we, we, our return is somewhere in between a bank loan and equity. It's certainly not up, an inf infinite upside like equity is. It's much closer to a bank loan. We target about a 25% interest rate. Uh, so it's, it's much closer to, to bank financing in that sense. Here's where it gets really interesting is from the entrepreneur perspective. Uh, like we said, if there's a personal guarantee in place, and the, the company doesn't succeed, that's uh, a huge risk to the entrepreneur on the downside. On the upside, however, if, if you finance your company with bank financing, uh, which is quite cheap, the entrepreneur does, does the best out of all the options. Conversely, equities, uh, you know, if the company doesn't do well the, the, and the company has taken venture capital, there's no risk to the entrepreneur or very little risk to the entrepreneur uh, as the equity investor is taking a lot of that downside risk. But if the company succeeds, it can be hugely expensive to the entrepreneur, uh, infinitely expensive, in, in fact. And what's interesting is that revenue-based finance is much, much closer to equity on the downside scenario for the entrepreneur. There's no personal guarantee. There's no personal risk. Uh, we try and get paid back, but just up to our principal amount if things go bad. Uh, and so if there's a liquidation, you know, anything else goes to the entrepreneur. But on the upside, like I said, it's much closer to a cost of capital like a bank loan. So if the business succeeds, you finance yourself with a relatively cheap cost of capital and the benefit is to you, the entrepreneur. It's a, a, a really nicely aligned, entrepreneur-aligned financing source. And at this point, uh, that's pretty much all that I had for today. I want to leave you with this graph of the options we've discussed and uh, at the various stages that we've, we've also talked about. And you can see, again, this is, this is very, very broad. Um, your own experience may vary. It's, it's, um, it's meant to just cover the, the basics and the overview. And uh, wanted to leave you with this. And again, we'll post all of this up on our blog and, and make it available for you in, in the recording as well. And I don't know if we have any questions that we should cover now or if stuff that we can follow up on after the fact. Um, yeah, I have two good questions from the listeners. Okay. Uh, thanks, guys. And the first is about strategic investors. Are strategic investors typically companies or individuals? Strategic investors are companies. Sorry if that wasn't clear. Uh, what I'm talking about there is um, usually most large companies will have their own investment group within the company. Uh, it's usually called, like Google Ventures you may have heard of or Microsoft just came out with Microsoft Ventures. Um, you know, all of these will have sort of their own VC group it, it's kind of what they're what they are or or even corp dev you know it's a corporate development group and they'll make investments they'll have a fund actually raised within the company and they can make investments either straight investments that are just equity investments to help you grow or it, oftentimes it will also include some sort of business development partnership you know um, some sort of uh, customer agreement with that strategic with say Microsoft or with Google or something great okay another question we just got is um, related to revenue-based financing. Um, so with Lyra Capital, if there's only two weeks to funding, does that mean there is no due diligence process? No, that's, that's a great question. Um, 
and that's not true. We certainly have our diligence process. It's just, like I said, we use a lot of technology to do that diligence quickly and efficiently for everyone. Um, we can, you know, we've got an online application. Um, please do, if you have not yet visited our website, please visit our website, lightercapital.com, and apply online at secure.lightercapital.com. And you can go through the application process and see the questions we ask. Uh, and then, you know, we have, like I said, we've built technology. We have some APIs that can quickly and efficiently get us the diligence that we need to uh, underwrite a loan very quickly. Great. Um, another question is, is, is there a place in this mix for convertible loans? Yeah, so Angels, uh, actually, before I answer that question, I do want to say one more thing about uh, RBF and technology with Lighter Capital. We also use that technology for ongoing servicing because we take payments every month, and we want to make that process also as least onerous as possible. So we use technology and uh, on our end to do a lot of the calculations on your, your revenue and uh, calculate what your payment will be and, and have you submit all of your forms and your financials very quickly and easily on a portal. Uh, so that's another piece of the ongoing monitoring, too, is, is uh, hopefully as least onerous as possible. Um, remind me of the question again. Oh, it was uh, about convertible loans. Oh, yeah. Where do they fit in? Yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah, typically they fit in with angels is where they're most common, and uh, secondarily maybe with friends and family. So convertible debt has become really popular with angels. This is a great question. It's actually kind of a topic all into itself. I'll try and cover it quickly. Convertible debt has become popular because it's a way for angels to get involved at the pre-revenue stage or very, very early revenue stage without having to try and hone in on a valuation. The valuation, you know, at that stage, trying to come up with a valuation for the company is really, really hard and probably going to be an intense negotiation. And that's not the goal at that point, right? The goal is to get the company capital and let them grow and get to a point where they can do a formal VC round and, and get valued. Uh, formally, you know, so the, the convertible debt is is a structure that's been invented, and there was actually a, a little bit of a, there's been a good debate. It's kind of cooled down now, but maybe about a year ago there was a great debate about whether convertible debt was good or bad. Um, and I can certainly post some some good uh, blog posts and thoughts by some other people too. I, I actually I blogged about it about a year ago as well. So on, there's an article in our our blog history too. Um, so yeah, it has the advantage of not having to have the valuation talk. It's technically a loan, but it has this convertible feature that if you ever do raise venture, then it turns into equity and just turn, you know, just goes away into an equity investment at that valuation. But uh, if you never raise equity, then it then it's actually just a straight loan, uh, usually like seven or eight percent or something interest rate um, that doesn't necessarily need to get paid every year. It can actually accrue and then get paid out down the road when the company has more financial resources. It can be a pretty good pretty good structure, um, and it's pretty common. So uh, I think there's even term sheets and things out on the web nowadays for convertible debt. Um, all right, we've got a lot of questions coming in, but we are running out of time, and I think uh, Citrix might kick us out, but I'm going to ask uh, one more, if and possibly more if we do have time. Um, so this one is in regards to RBF. Do you treat non-tech companies differently than tech, tech companies? So we will look at everything, and there are, kind of like that, that first slide that I started with, there are a lot of questions to answer and a lot of different intricacies and nuances with a different business model, and whether there's uh, assets in the business, what the, what, what the revenue model is, when you get paid, how, and um, that kind of thing. So we, we will use a little bit of a different eye towards non-tech companies. Um, and, and even within tech, right, there's subscription versus enterprise. There's a, there's a lot of different questions about um, that, that are important to revenue-based financing. So we'll look at everything, but uh, typically our model is best fit for uh, software and technology companies, particularly because we do take a percent of revenue. The company has to have pretty high gross margins. The highest we ever take is about 10% of revenue. Uh, so at, you know, at the bare minimum, you have to have 90% gro uh, you know, 90, 90 gross margins. All right, maybe we have time for one more. Okay. Um, let's see. There was a good question about crowdfunding. Okay. How does crowdfunding fit into the picture? Isn't it just a lower barrier kind of equity investment? No. Um, well, okay, so crowdfunding is a big um, – I was referring specifically to Kickstarter uh, and, and things like that, Indiegogo, where 
the investment is, I mean, these are the ones that are up and running today where it's, it's not an investment per se, it's actually just prepaying for a product. And that's, that's what it is. You're, you're, you're a customer and you're prepaying for a product. Um, true crowdfunding where you're openly soliciting the public is, can be anything. I mean, you can openly solicit the, the, the public for a debt offering, for a loan. You can openly solicit the, the, the public for an equity offering uh, or, or revenue-based finance. Um, and that's what's not legal yet. It's, uh, it, you're, you're, we're still a long way from that. The SEC hasn't actually fully um, ruled on that yet. So I'm, I'm not talking about that in this sense. Uh, and that's, again, kind of a topic for another, another day. But um, yeah, it can be equity. It can be a lot of things. But what I'm specifically talking about here is just prepaying for a product. All right. I, I believe we're out of time. Uh, we've got a lot of good questions that we'll follow up with via email. And um, okay. If there's anything you want to say? No, this is great. Um, we will. Uh, you know, we have everyone email. Um, we will probably, depending on what the que what remaining questions we have, we'll, we'll we'll dive in and maybe do an email blast out with some answers to the questions. That sounds good. But thank you very much for your time, everyone, and uh, we'll we'll talk to you soon. Yeah. Thanks for coming in.